All right, we are live, Christina. All right, everyone. Hi, how's it going? We're so excited to have you with us today. Welcome to the Phys Ed Summit and part of the first block session. This is session one, integrating meaningful technology in Phys Ed. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us on this amazing journey. I am super, super excited to be here, and uh, I'm super excited to introduce Christina, who is just an energizer bunny. The first time we met, I was so excited, and I was just like, yay! I was like, People call me an energizer bunny because I'm always going around crazy. I was like, but I was like, I can I can tell that Christine and I are gonna be super super good friends because we're, we're quite a bit alike. So I'm super excited to introduce her to you. But before we get to Christina, we just have a couple um, housekeeping things that I want to talk about. Um, so we are putting four sessions live at a time through a Google page. So we're hoping we don't get kicked out. We're not sure. We haven't tried this. Well, we, we attempted it. Kind of. So we had two sessions going at once, so we're hoping we don't get kicked out. So if we do, please just be patient with us. We have a backup plan, and then we will put the new link onto the conference program. So please just check that out. So first and foremost, we'd like to thank you, the participants, for taking the time to attend the summit, and uh, for Andy Vasley for his amazing, amazing keynote. I was very, very inspired, and I was doing a head nod like this the whole time. Like, my neck's a little bit sore from it. So thank you so much, Andy. It was very, very inspiring, and it was a great way to kick off the Phys Ed Summit. We would like to thank Spark PE for their sponsorship of the Phys Ed Summit. Spark is a research-based organization. They partner with the San Diego State University and are a strong supporter of online professional development. You can visit their website, sparkpe.org, to learn more about teacher resources, on-site workshops, and different content matched equipment. Quite neat stuff. Also, Spark has graciously, which we're very excited about this, they've graciously donated um, a couple items to our participants today. So how this works is when you fill out the, so at the end of the session, I'll put a link um, at the very, very end or a little screenshot up, and uh, it'll have a link to our conference survey. So just tell us kind of how we did, how it, how it was, what in sessions you enjoyed, etc. So. Um, we'll have a link up there, and then we're going to choose four lucky um, participants that participated to win the following prizes. So one person will win one Spark Dance DVD, one person will win a digital physical education program, one person will win a Summer Institute registration, which is pretty fantastic. I think it's worth $439, so thank you so much, Spark. And then another one will be a $150 gift certificate to the Spark store. So. Um, we'll push out the, summit, the survey right after each of these presentations. And uh, those who complete the survey by Halloween um, will be put into the draw. So please stay tuned for more information about that this upcoming week. Also, in order to receive your PD hours or certificate, if you need a certificate for these two PD hours or PDUs, um, again, you fill out that survey and you'll automatically get uh, a link to your certificate. It'll automatically be emailed. If for some reason you fill it, the survey out and you don't get an email, just please let me know and uh, we'll make sure that it's working for you. And all right, so I guess maybe I should have introduced myself. I'm Naomi Hartle, part of the, the Phys Ed Agogy team as well as the Phys Ed Summit team. Um, and yeah, some of you know who I am. You're not here for me. You're here to, to listen to Christina. So Christina, I'm pushing it off to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Naomi. And thank you for all of the work you've done uh, the past few months to make this happen. So thank you for all of that. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about um, integrating meaningful tech in PE. Um, so I'm going to share my screen in just a second. All right. Naomi, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself. Yes. Oh, no, not yet. I can see you. Maybe try again. Is it not working? Uh, I think we'll, we'll try this last time here. If not, we'll just have to go off the screen that I'm using. Sure. All right. So well, for some reason, um, it's not going into present mode. Um, I'll try again in a little bit. But for right now, um, we'll just go off the screen that I'm using. Sure. Um, so this picture right here is something that actually Naomi tweeted out a couple days ago, and it really resonated with me. Um, the second that I saw this picture, I thought uh, about an Instagram picture, a quote that was on Instagram that said, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And 
this is kind of how my journey started. When I first started um, teaching, I kind of stood in my comfort zone. I played it safe. I didn't want to integrate technology because I was afraid. Um, but the second I started integrating technology slowly, it has transformed my classroom. It has transformed me as an educator. And it most importantly has transformed my students. Um, so really going out of your comfort zone, it, it really will have such an awesome impact um, on your classroom and your students. So my hope today is that you can take one piece of information that I'm presenting today and implement it in your classroom um, and just try Oh, it looks like we might have lost her. So I'm just going to try and get her back on. So please just be patient with us. Having the curriculum drive the use of technology. Sorry, I'm just going to stop you for a second. We just we lost you for a little bit there. Um, so <laughs> you're My back bad. now. You're back now. Yeah. So I can't remember where you left off there, but maybe go back about two minutes. <laughs> oh, and now I can see the screen. Now it's being shared. All right. And it might be just All right, because cool. we have I think, do you have my screen and are we good now? I can see myself. Yep. Can you, see my, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, OK. Uh, did you get the part where I talked about just my comfort zone? We... Yes. Got that okay. part. Perfect. Um, so uh, I think the most important thing is to start small. So having a goal that you want to achieve each year within technology. So maybe you want to do a flip classroom or a flip type of digital learning and just start off with a few lessons and then slowly start reaching further and further. Um, curriculum drives the use of technology. I think it's very important that whatever you're doing, it should be, the goal should be student learning. What are students getting out of that use of technology? It should be enhancing their learning. Um, it should be keeping them engaged. And you shouldn't be implementing technology just for the sake of, I want to just implement technology, so I'm going to let kids bring their phones to class. It really should have, be meaningful and purposeful. Um, I try to implement technology to maximize activity time. Um, our program where I teach is, is fitness-based. So my objectives are always to try to maximize as much activity time as I can. And two important questions that I ask myself when I'm implementing something new or a new type of technology is, how will technology enhance student learning? And will it give them a deeper understanding of the content? So that's something that I use as a guide on implementing tech. So the first thing I want to go into is uh, the PE Flip Classroom. Um, we have a pretty lengthy curriculum um, within, our, within our school district. And I wanted to find a way to, to deliver the information to the students um, digitally. So we weren't taking a lot of time out of class to just go over some some things that I felt that they can learn digitally. Um, all of the concepts are reinforced in class. So everything that they are learning digitally is also being reinforced in class, but through activity. So if we're talking about um, skill-related fitness components, um, the, students are, the students are going into activities where they're doing, but they're learning about agility. They're learning about uh, balance. They're learning about uh, power, all of those types of things. But then they're also going on to um, our digital um, lesson in learning that material. So it's being reinforced in two places. But it's being reinforced in class, as far as activity, and then on blend space, which is where we, uh, of the platform that we use to deliver our digital lessons. Um, so blend space basically allows you to consolidate all of your files. So basically, any files you've used, um, whether they're videos, PowerPoints, um, uh, Google Documents, links, anything can all go on Blend Space. Um, it allows you to create engaging and interactive lessons. Um, and the most important part, it allows students to move at their own pace. Oftentimes in PE, our students um, are such diverse learners. So this gives students an opportunity to go on to the digital lesson, learn the material at, that, at their pace. Um, so usually I give students about a week to a week and a half to complete each lesson. Um, which is great because some students don't always have access to um, the internet. They don't always have 
uh, laptops or mobile devices. So this lets them use our school resources within that period of time. So within BlendSpace, um, we uh, also include formative assessments and um, summative assessments. And I've been using Google Form on my blend spaces, um, and that's the aspect that I that I actually grade. Um, students will go through all of the different slides on blend space, which I'll show you in just a second. And in the last slide would be a Google Form, and that's what students will that will be their assessment of learning um, that I will be grading. So I'm going to click on this link. Uh, I'm going to click on the next page here just to show you some of the lessons that. Um, I have been using in my classroom that my colleagues and I have created. Um, so this is a lesson on aerobic and anaerobic. So we'd go through this material in class, we'd actually do an aerobic activity, we'd do anaerobic activities, talk about the differences, and then students would have a week to complete their online, um, their online lesson. So they would go through each slide, they would watch videos, they'll go through and read articles, complete formative assessment. So this would be a formative assessment just to kind of um, allow the student to um, assess themselves and see if they're understanding the material that's being presented. Christina, I'm just going to jump in for a second. Sure. We have a question from Evan sure. um, from on Twitter. And uh, he just said, is flipped classroom appropriate for elementary? What are your thoughts? Um, I, I would definitely say that um, to an extent, absolutely. Like videos can definitely be, I feel like, beneficial for kids. Um, for them to see, because they're definitely visual learners, they're interactive learners, so I definitely think to an extent, absolutely, you can put different pictures on there, you can put uh, videos, you can put maybe worksheets that you have, you can even showcase your students on blend space. So maybe you have a blend space and every week you add an elementary student that you have that's been doing a fantastic job. Maybe he's been doing awesome on locomotive act activities or something like that. So you can use blend space not only to to present information to students, but to showcase them and things like that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so as students go through, they would um, go through all of the slides. And the last slide would be their assessment of learning. So this would be a Google form. And the students would go through, and they would answer questions. And then they would submit the form. And then this would be the part that I'm grading. Um, we found that since we've implemented this uh, these types of activities, these, these digital learning, that uh, test scores have increased um, tremendously um, because it allows students to work out their own case. They don't feel pressured. They don't feel um, like stressed out if maybe they don't understand the material. It also allows them to maybe Google something, a word that they're not familiar with. Maybe they're not sure about um, a vocabulary word. It gives them a chance to, to further, le further the learning and, and do a little bit more research. Um, so I have a couple more lessons here, so feel free to click through them and, and check them out. Uh, Google applications. Within the last, we are a Google school, and with the last few years, um, I've been implementing Google Docs and Google presentations and Google Forms um, on a regular basis. Um, a way that I use Google Docs is allowing students to sign up for groups. So if we're going into a new unit, I send out a Google Form, I mean, sorry, a Google Doc, and the students can sign up right right then on their own time at home and um, sign up for a group that they want to be in. So maybe for a soccer unit, you have a competitive league, a recreation league, and maybe like an ultra competitive league. Students go on and choose a group that they want to be part of. Um, I also share Google Docs um, for homework assignments. So I might have a homework assignment, and I'll send it out through a Google Docs. Um, they'll complete the assignments and then share it back to me so then I can then assess them. And right there on Google Docs, I can access um, comments, so I can leave them comments, great job, highlight things, maybe they need to change something, or maybe they had a misconception, and I can address it right there on their Google Doc. And it's also a great opportunity to be able to share that with parents as well. Google Presentation. Um, I use Google Presentation um, as an opportunity to do application-based presentations, assignments, basically. Um, so what I do is I have students work either independently or collaboratively on assignments. So I'm going to click on uh, one of my student examples here. And this particular assignment, um, two students work together. And this is on um, the health-related fitness components. So they did this outside of class. This was a homework assignment. Um, they, so Sierra and Natasha both worked on this presentation. 
So Sierra worked on cardiovascular endurance and flexibility. Natasha worked on muscular strength and muscular endurance. And they both worked on the body composition slide. So as you go through the slides, they basically are covering information. And, and this basically is application-based, and it's an opportunity for me to see their understanding of the material. And the really cool part about Google Presentation is I always have the criteria where students have to comment on each, on each other's slides. So they're peer assessing each other. So before they even submit the presentation to me, they have to go into each other's slides and say, hey, this is really great, or maybe we should change this around, or whatever it might be, and it holds the students accountable. Um, so I found that the students really enjoy these activities. It allows them to draw their own student interest as well. Um, on this next example, it's a warm-up cool-down activity, and I allowed the students to choose any sport that they wanted to do. So this particular student wanted to create a warm-up and cool-down for um, cross-country. Um, that's a, a sport that he was currently in at the time. Um, so basically, he created a warm-up and cool-down uh, for um, cross-country. And some students so chose soccer, some students chose tennis, or whatever student interest that they had. And by making it more meaningful, this really increased their test scores when we had our final assessment um, on warm-up and cool-down. Uh, Google Form. Uh, as you saw, I, already, I, sh I showed you how I use it in the blend space. Um, but there's so many other ways that Google Form can be used in the classroom. Um, you can use Google Form. Um, by giving assessments. So you can have not only assessments, but you can do it by polling student interest. Um, sometimes I'll send out um, Google Forms on, OK, tomorrow we're having a circuit day. What kind of activities do you want included in that circuit? Um, you could do it to check for understanding. Um, you can use it as a self-assessment or reflection piece, where students are going through and, and um, creating those reflections. Oftentimes, that's um, something that I use for parent-teacher conference to generate discussion and to show parents um, some of the reflective pieces on their goals or um, how they feel like how they feel they're performing in class and things of that matter. Um, here are some examples. Here's an aerobic and anaerobic Google form that I've used. Uh, training principles where students have to go through. And this last one is one that I use for a, a fitness circuit survey. So students are going to go through and they're going to select activities they'd like to do during their circuit. QR codes. I recently, within the last few years, have started implementing QR codes, and it has been a fabulous journey. Um, the, you've already seen them on my screen so far. They're those little squares. Um, they're super easy to use. Um, you can create them in seconds. Um, it's totally free to generate QR codes, which is awesome. And you can basically share anything. You can share websites. You can share assessments. You can share videos and worksheets, um, and a whole lot of different things that you can share, um, which makes it really awesome, especially in PE when we're limited on time, um, if we want students to access information quickly and efficiently. I've also uh, been able to add um, Google Forms into QR codes so students can scan the QR code, and it brings up an assessment right away, um, which has been really great. And right here at the bottom, I have two different um, QR code generators that I've used, um, if you'd like to check those out. Um, so a couple ways you can implement QR codes in PE is creating a scavenger hunt. Um, that I've done that in my class. It's been really, really advantageous for the students. Um, they can quickly access videos. Um, we have a dance unit, and traditionally we're using laptops for students to access videos and to learn these dances. So instead, I created a QR code sheet where students could quickly just scan the sheet, and it had the YouTube video right on their phone. So they didn't have to fuss with logging into the computer. They didn't have to fuss with the battery being out on the laptop they're using or um, them not being able to log in because everyone's trying to log in at the same time and things of that matter. Um, so right here on this QR code is just an example from my dance unit of how I use QR codes by implementing a QR code sheet. The students would just go in, they can scan it, and they can, it'll bring them to an instructional video on how to do the wobble, how to do the cha-cha slide, how to do uh, Beyonce move your body, and things of that nature. And the students loved it because they got to bring their cell phones out to class. Um, I loved it because I wasn't spending time having the students log in, which could take you know 10 minutes just for them to get on their computers. Um, it was great because some of the students wanted to have their cell phones right in front of them while they were learning the dance. 
So that was really great, and, and the students enjoyed it. While you're just pausing there, um, we had a question on today's meet. Sure. Um, they just asked if you've ever used augmented reality, like the Arisma app or Daiquiri. Have you ever done any of that kind of stuff? I have not. I have not. Um, I'm not. I'm not really familiar with either of those apps, so I'll definitely have to check them out. Mm -hmm. I can talk to that a little bit later too if we yeah. have a little bit of time. Yeah, I've kind absolutely. of dabbled in it a, a tiny, tiny little bit, but sure. so there's the answer to that question. But we'll try and talk about it later if we get a chance. Great. Um, so these next apps I'm going to talk about, um, I pretty much use most of these um, on a frequent basis. Uh, the first app is Seconds. I highly recommend using this app. Um, you can get it on the Android market. You can also get it on the Apple market, the Apple um, iTunes Store. It is. They have a free version, so if you want to just try it out, try out the free version, and then it's like $2.99 for the uh, full version. Um, basically, it's a programmable interval timer. So if you're doing a, let's say you're doing a, a hit workout, you can set a song specifically for your high intensity um, workout. So let's say for your high intensity, you're going to have a song. And then you can tell the students, okay, for your rest period, it's going to be this song. And you can go through and Literally, you're not prompting them or anything. You're, they're just going based off the music. They know, okay, this song is on. I'm doing a high-intensity activity. This song is on. I get a rest period. And I hook, um, I hook my phone up to a Bluetooth speaker. So during that rest period, I bring the volume down, and I tell them what we're doing next. Okay, next exercise we're doing is high knees. And then they wait for that beep. They wait for that song, that prompt, and then they get moving. And then the rest period will come on. I'll bring the music down using my cell phone, and then I'll say, okay, Next thing we're going to do are burpees. And then they'll say, OK, and then we'll wait for that prompt. Um, sometimes we'll do this as a warm-up activity. Sometimes we'll do it for one of our heart rate monitor activities. It all depends. Oftentimes, I let the students choose what activities they're doing for the high-intensity um, exercises. Um, but it's really nice because you get to use music that's relevant to them, and they enjoy that. Um, the next app is Fit Radio. Um, it's uh, DJ Engineered Music. And basically, it's all the popular music that's out there with higher beats per minute. Um, so they have tons of different stations. They have a top 40 station, country station, rock, EDM, um, 80s, 90s, you name it. They have it on there. And it's awesome. We use this day to day during our activities while the kids are um, playing games. Um, we play this during their warm up. They love it. And it's in their uh, shorter clips of the song, so you're not hearing the full entire song, which is really great. Uh, QR Reader is what I use for QR codes. I know there's an array of QR code reader um, apps out there, but this is the one that I, I use. It is free in both the Android and the Apple Store. Map My Run. Um, this year is actually the first time I've implemented Map My Run. Um, this app uh, it allows you to track pace, calories. It hooks up to most heart rate monitor watches. Um, and then I do a uh, GPS running challenge. And what that is is students get with a partner, and they have their mobile device. They have the uh, Map My Run app. They start it when class starts, and then they get moving. And their objective is to try to get as much distance as they can within the class period. And at the end of class, I check and I and I log how many miles that they've ac accumulated. Um, you can make this a homework assignment where they have to get X amount of miles in within a week. Um, you can have it be a week challenge within class. Who's going to accumulate the most miles within a week? Um, the kids really get into the fact that I made it a challenge. They were competing against each other and competing against other classes. Um, they love the fact that they can bring their phone out. Um, they brought their headphones out. They were listening to music. Um, this app will tell you every mile marker you're at. So it'll say mile marker one, mile marker two, so it can keep students on track and keep them with their goals and objectives. Uh, what's your farm I guess. Um, so the next app, which I absolutely love, um, and it has really given me the opportunity to bring um, some of my creative juices into the classroom. So it's the DJ app. Basically, this app allows you to record um, music from your library. So it allows you to mix songs that you have within your um, cell phone library. Um, my school, we do have to use the um, Cooper Institute Fitness Gram testing. Um, so we use the Pacer test. and Basically, the pacer test is like a beef test, and the music in the background was like elevator-type music, kind of boring. You know, 
it, it wasn't very motivating. So what I did is I created new pacer tests with new music in the background using the DJ application. Um, and it's, it's really been awesome because I create a new mix for every time we're taking this test. So the kids are always looking forward to like, oh gosh, what song is going to be on the pacer this time? Um, I've also created a, a few different ones. I had some teacher requests for a rock one. So we did like the Rocky theme and the kids really enjoyed that. They really got into it. Um, so just in increasing motivation um, using music. Um, we have a question. Sure. Um, from today's meet, and they just said, so this is kind of going back to what you talked about before, does Fit Radio have the option to turn off explicit content? It does, absolutely, and I awesome. highly recommend doing it. Yes, it does. <laughs> Good idea. Great question. <laughs> this is a fabulous question. Yes, it does. So um, on the side, you can, and you can also, so let's say you're listening to a mix you really enjoy, you can uh, favorite it, and you can keep it in your favorite, so you can always go back to it. So if there's a mix that you really like, you can do that. It also, um, our department purchased like one account, so all of the teachers share one Fit Radio account, and it's really nice because other teachers will favorite some, and then I'll go in and check them out, and be like, oh, that's a really cool, that's a really cool um, the mix, and and the kids will say, hey, you know, Mrs. Krein, I really like this mix that you played today, and I'll just save it and kind of refer back to it. Um, so yeah, really great question. There's uh, the paid version is really great. There's no there's no ads or anything like that, which is really great. So thanks for that question. Um, so the last part of DJ that I use is I make mashups, um, which is I allow students to, to pick songs that they like, and then I create one big mashup. Do you, um, Naomi, do you know if I play this, will everyone hear it? You can try. You <laughs> can try. So here's like a, a PE mashup, like this is only a three minute clip of a song. Naomi, are you hearing that? A little bit, yep. Yeah, we can hear it. So basically what I do is I only do like a, a few, like 30 seconds of all a bunch of different songs. So it kind of gets kids excited because, oh, I want this song to be played in class and they'll get to hear it. So they get really excited during their jog. Sometimes they'll go into a dance and things like that while they're jogging. Um, it just really gets kids excited. It makes the time go a little bit faster um, when we're doing some of our exercises and some of our warm-ups and things like that. So students enjoy that, and it's super easy to use this application. Um, I personally use it on my, um, my iPad, but you can use it on your iPhone as well or Android devices as well. So highly recommend using the DJ app. My fitness pal um, is something that we use in our junior senior classes. Um, it allows you to track um, your calories based on all the meals that you eat. Um, the cool thing is it syncs with the web. So if a student doesn't have access to um, the phone or anything like that to track their meals, they can actually do it on the web. And if they do enter it in on their phone, it goes straight to the web, which is really cool. Um, it tra tracks all the major nutrients, so it'll show the amount of proteins that they ate amount of carbohydrates, all that stuff um, right on that app, and it's also web-based, and then they sync together. What we do with our students is we have them um, track all of, their, um, all of their meals and exercise for a week, and then we kind of then reflect on their meals, and we talk about caloric intake and a lot of those types of things. Um, and students are really surprised um, about their data that they end up receiving, which is it's a really it's a really interesting project that we do. If anyone's interested in it, I'd love to share it with you. Um, but it also um, allows students to see are, are they getting enough are they getting enough calories based on their activity and, and things of that matter. Um, so highly recommend using my Fitness Pal um, students. It also has a huge library, so you can type in um, Trader Joe's. Um, apple chips, and it'll have literally Trader Joe's apple chips. The, the amount of food that they have in there is really extensive. Sally is uh, is another app that I use. It, it's for group messages. Sorry, can I just sorry yeah. just stop you for a second? Um, sure. One question. This is kind of going back to when you're talking about Blend Space. How sure. long have um, you and your colleagues been using Blend Space for? And do lessons take long to prepare? Okay, so awesome question. Um, I this is year three for us. It was previously previously Ed Canvas. If anyone's familiar with Ed Canvas, so 
So Ed Canvas transformed to Blend Space. So we first started using it uh, when it was Ed Canvas. And not at all, because Blend Space, and I'll click over to set Blend Space really quick. Um, if I go to my home, I just so you can get an idea of what it looks like to create a lesson. On the right hand side, if you see here, this is how quickly you can add things to your uh, blend space. Oh, we can't see it. Oh, you cannot see what I'm seeing right now? No, we're just seeing that slide. Oh, now we can. Keep. Okay. Okay. So um, if you see here on the right hand side here, um, this is all of the things that you can add to your blend space. So if I wanted to add a YouTube video, it's as easy as me typing it in here. I can type in fitness and it'll show a bunch of fitness videos and I can actually preview them here within blend space. Um, and then all I would do is drag it in and then it's in my blend space. So they're not, it's not time consuming at all um, to, to create these. It's actually quite easy. Um, I also teach health education and oftentimes I use this when I have subs. So my sub plans basically will be have the students check their email and complete the blend space. And it's, I literally can create a, an, a, a lesson pretty quickly. And you can use Google Drive um, by just going right here into your drive and it'll load up your drive and you can drag in files. Um, you can use um, EDU creations um, just by Google searching. You can do articles, you name it. So it, it's pretty easy um, to create. And the cool part is the collaborative piece of Blend Space is I can share this with one of my colleagues. They basically use this copy. There's a copy. Um, you can't see because no one shared one with me, but normally on the top there's a copy um, icon and you can copy the lesson and you can add whatever you'd like to it. So oftentimes one of us will create a lesson, we'll share it with our colleagues, and then we'll just change the Google form at the end. So then we're receiving our, our students' responses, not other teachers' students' responses. So it's super easy. A lot of times I'll send it to a colleague We'll add stuff in, reshare it back. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, so it's great. And every year we try to build upon our lesson. So to answer your question, we've been using it for, um, this will be year three for us. Okay, so um, back to talking about some of the apps that I use in class and um, in teaching is Sally is a great app. It's, it's used for group messaging. Um, there's no size limit. So you can use this for all of your students. Um, you can even extend it out to parents if you'd like. Um, you can send reminders. You can poll your students. There's a lot of privacy controls where you can set it up where only they can only view the messages. They can't respond. You can change it if you have smaller classes and you want the students to be able to respond. Maybe they have a question. You know, you can send out a message. Don't forget you have this homework assignment due. And a student can say, what was that homework assignment again? you want to set it up like that, or you can just have it where it's mass messaging. You can say, okay, don't forget we have an assessment on Friday, or you have a blend space assignment that's due on Thursday. Um, it's a good opportunity, too, for you to in, in, um, include parents. You know, don't forget we have parent-teacher conference next Thursday, or whatever it might be. Um, so it keeps students engaged, it keeps parents involved and in the know, which um, I know they really appreciate. So I highly recommend using Selly. I know there's a lot of other groups uh, messaging apps out there, but this is just the one that I've been using and I've really enjoyed. Um, Selly also has the ability, um, so I can go on my Selly account online and send out messages. So if I don't have my mobile device with me to use the app, I can go right onto my computer and send out a message. Don't forget to bring your laptops, don't forget to bring your phones and make sure they're charged. And I can do that right from my computer, which has been um, really useful. Utilizing mobile devices. Um, this is something I've been doing more and more, is just trying to utilize mobile devices in class. Um, I'd recommend polling your students first, finding out how many of your students have cell phones. Um, how many of them have maybe um, iPods, if you have wireless in your school. Um, how many of them have maybe iPads or things like that. My school particularly isn't one-to-one -one yet. Um, we're getting close to being one-to-one, -one, but we're not one-to-one -one quite yet. So. Um, we don't have the ability to have like iPads or anything like that. So um, the first thing I do is I pull students to find out what they have. Um, and some great ways to use mobile devices is for video recording in your class. And maybe if you um, if you skill assess, 
um, then you want to have the students video record each other and then kind of assess using that video. Um, for MP3 players, if you're um, doing a, a heart rate monitor workout and you want students to just work independently, they can use their music um, as some motivation. Utilize apps. Um, I've had students utilize some fitness apps. You know, there's certain days where we work on heart monitors and students have choice on the exercises they do. They've utilized like Nike uh, Fit Camp and things like that where they can just use apps um, that they have in class. Um, you can use the stopwatch. Maybe you don't have heart rate monitors quite yet. You can do that to maybe have the students get their exercise heart rate. Um, maybe you want them to, to find the resting heart rate um, and things of that nature. Um, you can also use mobile devices as assessment tools. You know, by whether it's QR codes, whether it's you're emailing them a, a Google form or things like that. So there's always opportunities to use mobile devices in class. And something um, I often tell my students is that it's important that they're using the mobile devices the way that they're intended to be used for that day. Um, so I don't let students just bring them out to class every day. I have to give them permission for that day, and then they have to use them for whatever reason it is. So if we're doing a Map My Run GPS challenge, that's the reason that they're using them. So they're not going to be using like Snapchat or texting and things like that. And usually if they do do that, then they lose the opportunity to bring them to class. And I honestly haven't had any issues where students weren't on task. They're just really excited to use them and to be engaged and, and to have them out. So um, I haven't really come in, in any issues with students not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The next, uh, the next technology that has really um, been beneficial in an RPE program here is using smart technologies. Um, we don't have smart boards in our field house or in any of our facilities. But our other classrooms, other like our English classrooms and our math classrooms all have smart boards. So what we've done is we've gotten the smart program on all of our laptops. And um, we've used the smart response clickers. And you can see right here in the picture, and this is what they look like. Um, we hand out assessments, and the students respond using these clickers. And right when the student responds, we get it right to our computer. So it's instant feedback. Um, we use this for formative and summative assessments. Sometimes I use this as like a pre-assessment. Students will grab a half sheet, answer the questions on their smart responders, and it goes straight to my straight to my laptop, and I and I can see um, what their answers are. And I really like this because it's instant. Right then and there, I can address misconceptions. Maybe a lot of students got number one wrong, and then I can kind of address: was it a poorly um, was it a poor question? Did I not go over that material well enough? Um, or for whatever reason, I can address it right then and there. Um, it lets me track data and student performance. So each student has a profile um, with a smart responder. They put in their school ID. And then I can track all of their assessment data throughout the whole semester, um, which has been awesome because I can kind of um, see, well, maybe a student has been performing well in all these assessments, but they didn't perform too well in this assessment. And I can have that conversation with that student. Um, whether maybe it was the, the actual assessment or the content or whatever it might be. Um, it's a great tool to poll students. Um, it's super easy. The students just type it in, and then it comes up on the board if you choose for it to come up through a projector. And you can see um, um, some of the students' responses. Heart rate monitors um, are something that I use twice a week. So all of my students. I use heart rate monitors twice a week, and it allows me to objectively assess students. Um, each student has a uh, individualized target heart rate zone based on their fitness level. So I use the Carbonin formula. So each student, based on their resting heart rate, um, is given a target heart rate zone, which is between 60 and 80% of their max heart rate. And that's their target zone. So whenever we do heart rate monitor days, that's the student's objective. Um, it's awesome because it ensures that students are working within that target heart rate zone. Um, it allows them to exercise safely. They know if they need to increase intensity. They know if they need to decrease their intensity level. Um, they're getting instant feedback on their performance, which is great. And it allows, uh, it allows me to track data. So I track all of my students' resting heart rates. Um, I track all of my students' exercise um, averages. So after their workout, after a 30-minute workout, I'll record what they were at after that workout. And this is great conversation for me when I have parent-teacher conferences. I can show you know, the changes in the resting heart rate, if there are any changes, and I can show their parents 
you know, what all of their exercise um, exercise averages were throughout the semester or whatever it might be. So it, it's really it's awesome. It's great for the students. It's great for the parents to be informed on their students' performance and their fitness level. Bluetooth technology. Um, this has been an absolutely great tool in my classroom um, for a few reasons. Those two models at the bottom are what I specifically use in my classroom. Um, it's the ION. If you click on it, it actually sends you to the Amazon in case you are interested in purchasing um, either one of those speakers. Um, but it allows you to hook up straight to your phone so you can increase volume and decrease volume so you're not having to yell over uh, music. You're not having to use remote control to change music. You can do it straight from your mobile device. Um, I use this with the Seconds app all the time when I'm doing circuits. Um, you can move it with you, so I'll take this to an outside facility with me. And it's fantastic because it doesn't, it, it charges and then it, um, it has a battery life. So then you can use it without having it to be plugged in. Um, so it's really been beneficial. Um, I love using it. The students enjoy it. Sometimes they'll ask to play their own music, so they'll hook up their phones to, to, the, to the Bluetooth, which has really just been great. Um, and here's my contact information if you have any questions. I hope um, that if you have any questions, you can contact me if you want to collaborate or if you want any of the additional resources of things that I've talked about. Um, please let me know. I'd love to share them with you. Um, but overall, thank you so much for listening in, and I appreciate it. All right, thanks so much, Christina. That was absolutely amazing. The Twitter and today's meet, I'm just like, my brain is going crazy because I'm trying to go back and forth between the two of them, and it's <laughs> awesome. Like, it's just fantastic. Um, one person had a question. Um, it said, yeah. please, could you ask whether she's used iBeacons? I haven't yet, but I've heard great things in potential. Have you heard of that before? What is it called? iBeacons? No. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no, but I'm interested to know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Please let us know more. <laughs> yes. It sounds like it has to do with like maybe something with like Bluetooth or like, I, I don't know. So. Yeah, I was talking about it, or they popped up um, when you were talking about Bluetooth. Okay, another question. Are you using video analysis apps um, to give instant feedback to your students? I am not. Um, our program here at the school that I teach at is uh, fitness-based, so we don't do any skill assessment. So all of our assessments are... Um, basically using heart rate monitors, and it's also um, with our cognitive type assessments, so with our curriculum and things like that. So we don't do any video type assessment on skill. Gotcha. Uh, another quite well, I guess more of a comment. Um, so Eric on Twitter just said, um, you know, amazing stuff, trying to think of how to translate to elementary level. Um, I teach grade, well, I guess the lowest that I teach is grade three. Um, and I use like Google Forms and QR codes and all that stuff with my grade threes. Like, I mean, with them you do have to really kind of, I don't want to say train them because we're not training our kids, but you really have to get them to, you know, you practice what you, what you do, right? So you have to take time to set it up with them. But once they know, they know exactly how to do it. Like I've been very lucky where I teach, we have a lot of technology in our school. We're fairly close to one-to-one, -to -one. Um, or if I want, you know, any type of technology, it's available to me. So my students have that background. They already know how to use it, but when I teach them something new, like when I was using augmented reality with my kids, um, it was really just, okay, you know, here's the app, go to that app, you know, hold it up to the poster, and this is how it works. So really it's just trying to get them, you know, familiar with the tools and then allowing them to do it. You'd be really surprised with what they can do. We have our grades, I think, ones and twos in the computer lab typing things up. As I mean, to the most part, <laughs> for what you know, their spelling ability, but we have them doing a bunch of different things like that. So it's just setting it up so that it works with them and, and showing them how to use it properly. And, and I totally agree. And we have so many students who have such diverse backgrounds when it comes to technology. I mean, we have a lot of students who have used technology, whether it's cell phones, computers, and then we have other students who don't have any background on those things. And um, just as you mentioned, Naomi, like introducing it, and once it's introduced and you show them how to use it, it becomes pretty second nature, kind of like blend space. You know, when we first implemented it, it was the students like, right, oh my gosh, what is this? Like, this is PE, this is not what it was like when I was in junior high. And now it's so second nature. I'm like, okay, guys, you have a blend space, anaerobic and anaerobic. Do you on Friday? And they're like, okay, got it. Like, you know, so it's become second nature where 
there's not, you know, and not only that, I think it's important to, like, at least um, having students also, like, look up things and research things. So it's oftentimes students have questions, and I often prompt them, well, try seeing if you can find the answer and try researching it and seeing if you can find it. Because as you know, as professionals, that's how we learn a lot of things is researching and inquiry and things like that. So just having students build those skills. Right, exactly. Um, one of the questions that popped up as well, oh, it's for me. <laughs> do you have your students bring iPhones P? Some of them do, yeah. We have iPads that we use, so I usually gather the iPads or laptops or Chromebooks that we have at our school, um, just because I'd rather them use that. Sometimes they try, they get distracted a little bit by texting or Snapchat, kind of like you said, <laughs> Christine, right? But happens once, it does not happen again because, well, they know we're using it appropriately, right? You come to Phys Ed to learn things. It's not just to come play games. You know, it's it's not, I'm not rolling out the ball and just saying, hey, go ahead. It's it's your day today, whatever you want. You know, it's, we have, there's a purpose. We're learning something. And uh, so sometimes I have them bring their phones if I let them know ahead of time. But I have enough devices in my school that I don't need to do that. In some schools, absolutely. I mean, if, if they can use their phones and you can show them how to have a positive digital footprint, showing them how to use it in the right way and not just, you know, to text somebody, right? There's, you know, our phone, there's so, this is a mini computer in our hands. Like, how amazing is that, right? Like, it's so neat. So why not show them the positive things that we can use it for? Not that texting somebody or Snapchat isn't positive, but in school, we don't need to use it in school. So how can we show them how to utilize that tool in a, pro in a proper way for a school setting? So um, I tell them, if I tell them to bring it ahead of time, then they can. Um, and my, like, my classes, I usually have... Well, I teach in a small school, so I have class sizes anywhere between 13 to 20 kids, 24 kids, um, but that's mixed split classes. So I, I, right now I have a 3, 4, 5 split class, and there's 15 kids. I have a 6, 7 class, there's 20, 22, uh, and then 8, 9, and there's 20. So, I mean, my class sizes aren't the biggest, but I am looking at two different curriculums when I'm teaching them. So it just depends, really. And Christina, you teach high school, am I right? I do, and um, I do, like I, like you said, I'll tell students ahead of time, um, and that's a great opportunity, something like Sally, like hey, a mass text message kind of thing, hey, bring your mobile devices, you can send email, because the biggest thing is making sure kids have their devices charged, because by the end of the day, that's something that um, I do find is a challenge, so I always tell students, make sure, hey, you have enough battery for class, eighth hour, because we're going to do a GPS challenge, or we're going to do um, whatever it might be, however we're using our cell phones, so um, that's really important, so I always have students, they don't bring them every day, but they bring them when I prompt them to do that. Exactly, yeah, and I use Remind. It used to be Remind 101, but now it's Remind. Um, and actually, I haven't really used, utilized it to its full potential now, but I think you can like start sending like videos, or not videos, but like um, pictures through Remind too, and I'm just like, oh, that is so cool. So I could have parents sign up to this Remind, you know, they can get on their phone or on email, and I could send pictures of what the kids are doing in class. Like, how cool is that? Like, we can communicate. It's a communication with parents. So not just with their students, but with their parents, too. So way too cool. Just the things that you can use, that you can use, right? For, I mean, and again, like, we show, you know, Christina shows all these amazing things. And, you know, we've talked about, you know, tech and phys ed. But really choose one thing and focus on one thing. Don't try and implement everything at once, because for one, it's going to overwhelm you. And it's going to overwhelm your students quite a bit. So slowly kind of build into it and uh, pick one thing. Like Christina's been doing this for a couple of years. I've been doing this for a couple of years. And, you know, we started with one thing and we built into it. So I guess that's my advice for anybody that's viewing is to just take it slow. Absolutely. I, I totally agree, Naomi. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. How often do you use tech within your PE classes? I don't know which, who's that for, but I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> um, so... It all depends. I use kind of Bluetooth technology kind of on the daily. Um, that's with music and things like that. Um, when I do my, like I said, I do heart monitors twice a, day, twice a week, so I'm using that second app, um, and I'm using um, heart monitors, which is obviously a piece of technology, too. I'm using blend space pretty frequently as well, so I feel like I use it pretty often. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm using cell phones in the classroom every day, but I am using different types of technology. And right. Um, another question, what are ideas for using Chromebooks in Phys Ed? Have you used any Chromebooks? So right now our school is in a uh, pilot program, so we do have h half of our students um, are using Chromebooks, half of them are not. Um, next year we're supposed to be at Chromebooks, and I, I cannot wait. I think it's going to be an amazing experience with my love for technology and for all my students to have Chromebooks. 
But I think using Google Forms would be a great way to use Chromebooks, um, Google Docs, and Google pre Presentations. Um, there's oftentimes, I'm not sure about your school, but our school, we have late arrival days because of professional development things and things like that. So those are days oftentimes when classes are shorter. And those are awesome opportunities to use your Chromebooks for reflective pieces. You know, you can have students use their Chromebooks um, before they leave class to maybe rate their performance on that day or whatever it might be, maybe to rate themselves on your objectives. So I think there's an, like tons of opportunities to use Chromebooks. And you don't have to have all your students bring their Chromebooks, but you can have, you know, maybe one Chromebook per three students to do a reflective piece or, or something like that. Um, but I think that Chromebooks and PE, I, I definitely think there's tons of um, opportunities there. Absolutely, I agree completely. And one of the neat things you can do too is have a station set up, right? So you can have a station in your gym with a couple of Chromebooks and you know call kids throughout the you know your activity time and say, hey, I want you to go reflect quickly. Rather, so then it's not just everybody at one time that's going. You can still have them, the rest of the group moving around. They can go reflect whatever time it takes them to reflect, and then come back into the activity that you're doing with them. So just another example of, of what you can do. Um, and I, we'll do one more question here. And I guess one of the things that's kind of coming up on today's meet and and Twitter is just how, like, what's the ratio between tech and activity time? And I know for me, anytime I use tech, it is enhancing my students' learning and their understanding of the material, but it's also enhancing the activity time. Um, like, I use um, Tango Remote to, so I don't use Bluetooth, but I use a Tango Remote app between my phone and my iPod to work my music system, and that's my cl classroom management tool. Um, I also have a mic, and if I don't have those things, like my mic, mic broke this week, and um, I, it's been really a really difficult week for me because I'm trying to yell over top of the, my voice doesn't carry very loud and it does not carry in that gym. So I've been having difficulty, so that's one of the things that I'm struggling with this week. So we need to get a new mic, but um, is that it, it, it enhances, so it's my classroom management. Without it, it it's just like crazy chaos. Um, so for me, it, it enhances our student activity and it enhances their learning. So if, if it takes away from the activity time, then it shouldn't be implemented. And I mean, I've tried things and it has not worked and it's taken away from the activity time and I go back and I reflect. We make mistakes and we, we learn from those mistakes. Um, but you know, it, it makes you better as you go through it too. So there's gonna be times where you try it and it bombs, it fails and it, you're just like, oh, that was terrible. Like, what? I can't believe that happened. But you, you learn from it and you know, you let your students know and be honest with them and say, hey, we're trying something new today. I'm, I'm showing, showing you how I'm being vulnerable with you and how I'm taking risks to help your learning and uh, let's try it. If it. And if it just, you know, blows up in our face, okay. How can we, you know, get their feedback and say, how can we, how can I fix this? What do you think? What, what are some suggestions? And uh, go from there. So, yeah, Christine, you can add to that if, if you'd yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I feel like when you let students know that you're vulnerable with them, it just makes, it, it's really just an awesome experience. And I think students really appreciate that. Because um, there's been times where I've implemented new technologies, new technologies, and they did not work at all. And but I feel like it's made me such a stronger person, and it's given me the opportunity to to be okay that things don't work, but learning from those mistakes. And and that's really just been my journey with technology: is something doesn't work out, how am I going to change it, make it better, and and make this activity work? Or maybe it doesn't work at all, and I need to just throw it out and, and try something new. So absolutely. But for the most part, everything I do. Um, is to maximize activity time. Unfortunately, um, with our kids changing for PE and having so many students, um, we do lose time. So my objective is to maximize as much activity time and use technology as that vehicle to enhance that time and increase student motivation and things like that. So there, there's very little time where technology is taking over the class or things like that. It's really just as that enhancement and to get kids excited. Exactly, I agree 100%. All right, well, we're going to stop that there. I know there's some, still a few more questions that are out there, um, but you can continue, you know, checking out today's meet and Twitter. And, and it, the one thing that I was really excited to see on today's meet was people were, you know, they're asking questions and other people were jumping in and helping out because I was just like, oh, I can't answer all these questions. But it was fantastic to see the collaboration, and that's what this is all about. That's what the Phys Ed Summit is all about. That's what social media and the online Phys Ed community is all about. It's you know, sharing is caring and collaboration and connecting is amazing. Like this has just been a fantastic experience and I just want to say thank you so much, Christina. I've learned so many things right now and I'm just like, oh, I'm excited to go, you know, bring it back next next week and, and show my kids. So thank you so much You're for, 
for, you know, being here with us and I'm so excited to, you know, get to know you more and have more conversations, maybe be able to collaborate with you later on and maybe do some things with our students because that would be really exciting. Absolutely, and I'll jump on today's meet too if you have any other questions. I'd love to address them and I'll check out the Twitter, uh, t uh, tw Twitter back channel as well. And thank you so much and I'd love to answer any other questions and collaborate with anyone who's interested. Um, but thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you to the Phys Ed Summit team. You guys rock, so thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm just going to stop the broadcast here. So thank you, everyone. Tune in for session two, or sorry, block two. We have four different sessions. We have the elementary roundtable, high school, middle years, and the pre-service teachers. I will be moderating the pre-service teacher one or doing back channel stuff. Um, so, yeah, check it out. Thank you.